so we got you safe and sound through the surgery. Everything went great. You're in the recovery room. You're waking up. Everything's beautiful. You're uh, awake enough to know who you are, where you are. Uh, a lot of times parents are with you at this point. Sometimes not. It depends a little bit on your time and how busy the recovery room is. But at that point, we get you ready to go up to the floor and specifically to the, the pediatric ICU. I use the intensive care unit mainly as a precaution. I'm happy to say most of my kids don't actually need the ICU. But on the other hand, having it, and I shouldn't tell you that, but, um, having it is, is really, really good because it's, it's uh, much more intention. It's a much uh, smaller nurse to patient ratio. Uh, the physicians are right there. It's just really a, a very comforting thing. Um, I will say before I turn it over to Jessica that the ICU, uh, pediatric ICU, is not anything like what you've seen in TV shows or movies. Um, it's not a very scary place. It's actually a very, very nice, warm, comforting place, I think. There's a little bit of equipment that's a little bit daunting. Uh, but um, overall, uh, it's a separate room. The parents are encouraged, allowed to be with the, with the patient uh, throughout the ICU stay as well as the, uh, as the whole hospital stay. But let me turn it over to Jessica. She'll tell you about the ICU and about that process. Okay. Hello, everyone. <coughs> Excuse me. I recognize some of your faces um, you've come through our unit. So we've known, by the time you come to the ICU, we've known that you were coming all day long because we have a schedule um, when you're going to arrive. And you may have seen some of us because I see you doing your tours and we'll say hello and you know what, your, what the room will look like before you even get there. Um, but what happens when you come to us, you're usually still pretty um, sleepy. You may not even remember that this is going on. Um, now you may not remember what all happens at those first couple of hours in the intensive care unit. Um, but you're awake. We'll ask you a lot of questions. What's your pain? Um, you'll see several nurses. You're, you know, you're laying there and you'll see a lot of us hovering over you. That's just how we work in an ICU setting. We like to um, kind of do teamwork to get a lot of things done um, at once, but then you only have one nurse um, taking care of you. But basically what happens, you'll come and you'll have a lot of this, this equipment still attached, but what we use in the ICU is a little bit different. So we may take some of the, chain out your IVs and get rid of um, a lot of this extra tubing. So we'll have to pull off those clear stickers that she was referring to and put different little connections um, on your IVs. That's just because we need less ports um, in the ICU and on the regular pediatric floor. We don't need this many um, things. Um, your Foley um, will still be there. Um, sometimes we may have to change out the bag connection on it, but not always. Um, you have a lot of blankets from PACU and from OR. Um, if you're still cold, we'll leave them, but we may change out some blankets. <coughs> Um, by this time, you'll have a nice gray box. I couldn't bring it because it's a box that contains um, narcotics. A lot of the equipment that we utilize is already in the room, so I can't bring that room down here. But um, there's a big narcotic box. It's gray, and it's your PCA. Have you heard this word? I'm going to talk to you about what a PCA is. Um, it's patient control analgesia. It's going to be your, your um, daughter's best friend, um, your best friend. Um, but you can't push that button. Let me say that. You cannot push the button. What we'll give you is a button that you hold. It's connected to this big gray box, and you can have um, morphine <coughs> or fentanyl in this box, and you'll either get it continuous, a continuous infusion of this. This is to manage your pain. A continuous infusion of this medication, or and or when you push the button, there's a dose delivered. Um, if you come to us and you're very sleepy still. Um, and you're saying that you're, you're not having a lot of pain and maybe the um, PACU nurse has just given you pain medication, then you may only have what we call a demand dose and that means when you push the button, that's when pain medicine is delivered. If, it start, if you start waking up more and once anesthesia is um, clearing your system and you're awake and you're having more discomfort, we can add that continuous infusion um, called a basal rate. So you demand and basal, continuous or bolus, those are words that people use interchangeably. Um, but they're referring to your pain management. Um, our goal for your pain management is that you are comfortable. We cannot promise you pain-free because, um, as I said, you've had surgery. You, there's going to be a certain level of discomfort. We don't, so there's a zero to ten scale. We use zero is like the best day, you know, no pain, you're happy, wonderful day. Ten is the worst. We never want you to be at ten where you're, tear, you know, you're crying and you're just, having a terrible day. That's not where we want you to be. We're not going to let you get there and we don't want you to stay there if you happen to 
wander into two. <coughs> um, two to three is our it's what we want for you. We if you get to zero, and a lot of people are at zero. The reason I say we can't promise you pain free is because some it's all a subjective thing, meaning you decide what pain free feels like or what um, your certain level of comfort is. Some people, if there's just a small little twinge at all, that's painful. Some people can tolerate a whole lot more, and they understand soreness. They don't rec they don't rate that as pain. It's just a sore feeling. So um, basically, we want you to be comfortable, but you will have some soreness or some um, level, small level of discomfort, just because you've had surgery to your back. Is that understandable? Um, but we definitely do in our best. We will do everything. We have a long list of medications that we can give you. Um, if one isn't working, there's others. There's always something else that we can do to help you. So also other things that may occur during this period um, of time, because you've received those medications, and Renee alluded to this um, before, is you may have some nausea. Um, you may feel like you want to be sick because you haven't had anything in your stomach. You've had this medication. Now you're awake. Um, we have medication called Zofran that we can give you. Um, if you do get sick, and it's okay, it's um, not unexpected, we know what to do, we're professionals, we're <laughs> nurses are professionals at dealing with vomit, we're okay with that, um, and don't be alarmed, mothers, if they're um, nauseous or feeling that way. Um, a lot of times when um, everyone wakes up because they remember that they're hungry, because everything that has occurred before arriving to us, they don't even know, they've forgotten about it except for that ride into the um, OR room. So they don't know what, how many hours it's been. It's just maybe when they went in, they were hungry, and they, now they're awake, they're remembering, I'm still hungry. <laughs> and they're going to want to ask to eat. Um, and we're not going to let you eat a full meal. You can't have your, you know, your favorite meal right away. We're going to start small with some um, ice chips or some sips of water, because like I said, you may feel nauseous or you may you know, get sick just because you haven't had anything on your stomach. So we're, we're going to have to be the bad guy and limit what you take, even though um, your daughter is asking, we'll just have to, you know, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and we'll usually put the parents in charge of the ice, <laughs> give you the ice cup and say, you know, you can help, and, you know, give her some ice when she asks for it. Um, let's see, other things. While you're there, it is our job, because you're in the ICU, we have to bother you constantly, because that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the flip side about making one of these ICU services, is that we have to come into our patients at least every two hours. That is the standard of care in a critical care setting. Um, but it's to your benefit, because you will lay there and get sore. You can't just lay on your back um, the whole time. We're going to come in every two hours and turn you side to side, one side to the other. So you may go to your left side and stay there. And, not, and two hours is when we come, but if you're uncomfortable, we will come before the next two hours to move you, to reposition you, um, and then to your back, and then to your other side. So we need you to move so you don't get sore. This is to your benefit. It will help you on your next two um, post-op days that we're doing this to you. So the, your ICU stay is usually less than 24 hours with us, but this is what we're, we're going to bother you for that, <laughs> less than 24 hours. We will be in there um, constantly, and then when the nurse comes in, in the first about four hours that you're there, she's in there every hour because she has to check your vitals. She's going to keep asking you about your pain because you've got that big gray box hanging there that I was telling you about, the PCA. So we have to check vital signs because, um, as Renee was saying, when you're getting pain medications, they can cause you to breathe a little um, slower, um, so we want to make sure that you're okay. We're going to have you hooked up to those monitoring, all these monitoring things that she um, put on you before, they're still going to be there. So we're man monitoring your oxygen, how fast or how slow or how shallow you're breathing, and it's very, 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 very common when you're um, with us that your daughter will breathe shallow, which will set off the alarm, and we come in and look. She's breathing fine. Her oxygen is fine, but it's going to alarm. And we fight the battle overnight with <laughs> the monitor beeping because it doesn't pick up because she's not going to be taking really deep breaths. She's just kind of barely doing it because she's guarding because she, you know, is a little bit uncomfortable back here and maybe a little nervous about taking a full deep breath um, because she may be scared of if it's going to cause some pain. It, may, it will not cause pain because I'm going to tell you why, but this is just in your mind. Just like if you had a knee surgery, you're not going to go start, you know, kicking your knee out as soon as you had it there. You know, you're just going to be really cautious about every movement you make because you're not sure what it's going to feel like. Um, but while we're talking about deep breaths, um, 
In sinus spirometry, it's something we encourage to do in case, and this is a um, little machine you blow in to take deep breaths so that while you're you um, are expanding your lungs and not getting a pneumonia. This is something we do with um, most post-op patients. Uh, we want you to expand your lungs and breathe um, deeply. Like I said, it's to prevent a pneumonia. Um, and it does not hurt, you know, um, we encourage them to do it. Um, every hour we're in there, hand it to you, mom can do it. Um, encourage you to do it as well. So I said the turning, every two hour turning, um, and this is the first 24 hours. That next day, um, on post-op day one, Dr. Mankin comes in early in the morning. He's like clockwork. <laughs> He's here before even the next shift or nurses start on um, day shift. And he'll come in and see you, um, check you out. He'll ask us how you did overnight. And most likely it's, they did wonderfully. Um, a little bit of nausea, if you did, you know, we'll just fill him in on whatever happened overnight. Um, and then he was writing orders for you to go to the floor. And you're done with your ICU visit. Um, and so you're going to be, of course, you have to wait for a bed. So it's not that fast. Things don't happen that fast. I give you this warning because um, there, are other, there are all types of patients on the pediatric floor. And they're usually to capacity all the time. So patients get discharged in the day. You're on the list to go out there. And as soon as the room is um, available, we send you out. But we're still caring for you, and everything that would happen on the regular floor will happen in the ICU instead. But our rooms look very much the same, so it's not a huge transition to go from one place to the next place. Um, day one, PT will come and see you. Do you want me to go keep going this far? Or? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so PT comes to see you, and they're going to have you sit up. You know, this will be the first time that you're going to sit up. Um, maybe dangle your legs on the side of the bed, <coughs> of the bed and um, try to ambulate, walk over to a bedside chair. Um, depending on how well you do, depends on how far you may go that first day, um, maybe to the bathroom. Once you are able to get up and walk um, to the bathroom, then you can have your Foley, that catheter that's draining your ear, and you can have that taken out. Um, you don't want to do it before because then you'll have the issue of well, now what do I do when I'm in the bed? How am I going to use the bathroom? And that's definitely not comfortable to have to use a bedpan, and it doesn't help you at all. So we'd rather leave the Foley until you can walk to the bathroom. Um, and then your next day, so after that, you still may have your PCA. We're going to start transitioning, transitioning you off of the PCA, which is going through your IV, to giving you oral medications. You should be eating by this time, um, taking a meal if you, if you have not had too much vomiting um, or nausea, which um, you definitely shouldn't have it um, that bad that you cannot eat. Um, now you can take pain meds by mouth, like a you know a pill, not the IV anymore. Um, so you, third, the second day, um, you walking around the unit with PT, helping you um, move, making sure everything is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and this is pretty much how the the stay goes. We've been doing this so long. Um, with Dr. Mankin and um, spinal fusion um, patients come through quite regularly in the summer. It's, 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 you know, this is when we start kicking up and expecting to see um, the most coming in, but there's some all through the year. But anyway, my point is that it's like clockwork. We know what to expect. Most people follow the exact same course every time from 5 a.m. that day to come to surgery till the um, third day when, or fourth day when you go home. So. We're experts. I feel like we're experts at it. We know what to expect. He trusts us. We trust him. And oh, while you're in, um, in the hospital, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you in the ICU and on the regular pediatric floor, your pain management. We have a pediatric intensivist, a doctor that's there, and he is there around 24 7 um, to answer questions if you're having pain. Remember, I said there's always something else available if we run into issues. They're managing the pain portion, pain management portion. Okay? Good. And that's it. Three days to go home. Three months were perfect. Everything's good. <laughs>